we have a huge responsibility to help them along the way. So that's been a real challenge for me when I started coaching. Hey guys, real quick, right before we start this episode, I do want to mention the fact that you are going to hear some names bleeped out. This is to protect the privacy of the player we might be talking about. Um, the objective the objective of doing something like this is not to hide or keep some of the context out of it, but it is to make sure that some of the context is not warped about a specific player. There are often instances that are very personal, and we want to make sure that those remain personal and private. Yeah. And, and I mean like, okay, so let's assume like nothing wrong with right. And like, okay, we came out of the, the pull down phase this year, zero injuries. Like, yeah, you got like guys that are gassed and everything, but that's part of the intention of them too. I think like, yes, there's risk, but I think we've done an unbelievable job of understanding that risk, learning more and more about that risk, um, transitioning sort of just allowing the emotions to take over even for ourselves because it's enjoyable. Like, you know, we've put a lot of time and effort into that kid too. We want to see him really succeed. You know, yesterday's hitting that. That's like, fuck yeah. Yeah. Like this kid has never thrown that hard on a pull down. Hasn't really been able to organize pull downs before in his life. And now all of a sudden he can. And just like the confidence of him walking around after like, yeah, got his powers back again. Yeah. Well, you just, I mean, like shit, we can go into like even the the psychological dynamics of the entire building after that. You just, a new alpha just emerged. And right. And we were sort of waiting for him because um, like I had Kenny this morning send me uh, two videos, uh, one of and one of uh, uh, and doing the pull downs. And the reason is I think it was 99.8, right? Like 99.8. He just picks up the ball, just walks back. Yeah, great. Cool. And then you have who explodes, draws the energy from the crowd, right? Oh, of course. It's a, it's, it's, it is literally contagious and it's, it's attracting. Like, you're just like, wow. Like, you know, uh, Kenny sent me the video or he posted the video last night. And my only comment back to him was this kid is electric and it, he causes you to root for him. It's not like, I'm not rooting for him. Like, obviously I love, him. I want to see him be successful and, and, Ultimately, maybe he's just better at managing his emotions um, and and not displaying them. Uh, my true point to this was though those kids need to be coached vastly different. And with maybe we need to find a little bit more of that top end emotion and find a way to express it. And with we need to manage the roller coaster. Yeah. And and we, you know, because when you get a guy that the emotional energy can take over that much. Um, that, that is both really positive and also can be daunting to control. Yeah. And you can see it in the fluctuation in his throw. Yeah. Just the way his emotions of the day can control his performance of that, where probably more steady, more of a quiet confidence and he's steady every day in the building and, you know, kind of even, even from Saturday to Tuesday, a completely different person. Oh, completely different. I mean like the same way, right? So it's, it's these guys. So all, everything in life is energy, right? So emotions are just a, a way to express that energy. And it's a way to release some of that energy, right? And certain emotions require more energy and come out with more energy, right? Fear, however, is not very visible to like our face. Uh, unfortunately, it has some of the biggest emotions like and, and or sorry, some of the biggest energy tied to it, right? And that's why it's so controlling to us. Whereas like happiness, it may have this really large spike in energy, but it's like fleeting. It's quick, in and out. Um, and, you know, I was, I was talking to, to Joe yesterday about this and I said, well, what if we change the perspective of what we're chasing? Do we think it would change the energy that's required from each emotion? So fear has this gigantic amount of energy that's required in it, right? And it, and, it, and it just pulls this energy from you. But fear is largely based in the future. So fear is largely about being afraid certain things weren't going to happen or are going to happen in a way in which you're not going to be comfortable, right? But a lot of that is because as humans, and I think we were talking about this yesterday, we, we innately, especially Americans, we innately are like it's 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 ingrained in us to chase success we only seek success 
we forget the fact that success and failure are this interchangeable loop that must both be present in order for us to continuously and exponentially get more of either. Well, if we switch that and we sought out failure, like we literally pushed as hard as we could push to fail every time, then success would merely just be this sort of result or consequence of learning from failure all the time. And we might be able to strip fear of a lot of its energy. How do you feel like, like for, for Joe, like professional, which is outcome based, everything he does is measured, quantified, yep. judged. Like, which is also trickling all the way down, by the way. Yeah, every every yeah. throw these kids make nowadays is 100%. Is and same. you can see it. I, I, so different from when I was a teenager coming through, like the mm-hmm. amount of things that are being recorded, posted, measured, quantified, like the access to information they have is so completely different from when I was in high school. And I can see the weight of it every time when they Uh, come in the building. And it's something like we really have to try and manage like the culture around there and having it be a competitive place, but also kind of a a safe place for them to come in and let loose and be themselves and not worried about being judged or, you know, you know, evaluated all the time. So yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I don't, uh, it's, it's just so completely different from when I was playing as a 16 year old, I was not thinking about my pull down velocity and how it compared to the other, you know, 15 guys in my area and, you know, what my spin rate was and the, the horizontal break on my slider, all these different things that they're getting overwhelmed with. Um, ultimately can be kind of baggage as they try and develop. And like, it's so easy to feel negative about any kind of metric that you're given that, you know, it's also kind of our job to manage the information into them as well. So we don't, you know, give them something that's going to take them sideways for a year or two when they're so young in their development. Oh, there's so much to unpack there. Going back to like your original point with, or your question sort of, which was like, how do you think Joe deals with that? Um, I want to almost like table that for a second and yeah. come to uh, the point of how we have to manage the information. And I, I, you know, I talk about this all the time uh, and you've heard me say it. I, I think it, as much as humanly possible, we try and avoid using the term mechanics because of the negative connotations that are automatically, you know, in our baseball society uh, connected to the word mechanics. And the idea is the information has likely caused, and it's not the information, it's the manner in which the information was dispensed and without accord or 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 recognition for the emotional impact and consequences that that information would have right it's it's just dispensed period end of story we've heard it time and time again with college and professional levels right information is just overloaded here you go here you go here you go here you go and you're not good at this 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 and this you need to work on those yeah keep doing this great and it's like oh okay so so emotionally uh, I'm supposed to take away that there's 50 things I'm doing wrong and about two things that I do really right that are outliers but I should focus on all the 50 things I'm doing wrong. And I think a lot of times our inability to effectively communicate leads to a lot of athletes getting in really bad situations. Yeah. It's just like the challenge of the modern coach is you have to be literate in all these different things that you have access to now. And you have to be the filter for the athlete. You mm-hmm. have to process it and then guide it to them in a way that's going to be useful for them. And, you know, that's a challenge for us as well to stay up to date on the latest technology, everything that you're seeing on Instagram, the, the, the newest trend with a pitch, like all of it's a challenge. But I think the effective coach has the ability to kind of filter that information to the athlete in a way that's going to positively affect them and not just send them down a rabbit hole with the easiest thing that you're seeing, uh, you know, sweeper, you know, gyro, splitter, all these different terms that you can just look at on a on a track man plot and say, you should try and do this without really understanding the full context of the athlete and right. how they're going to execute that. So, yeah, I think that's like one of the major issues with social media, right? And and we're guilty of it too. And, and it's almost, it's a... Um, it's a dichotomy because social media's intention is to provide information in a highly consumable manner in a short clip or uh, you know to the point objective, right? And then those who are really good at social media are capable of getting their point across really fast, right? And so the dichotomy comes in with, well, when I have to get a message across really fast, I not only do I have to be really literate on the actual topic that I'm talking about, I have to be really, really, really good 
at delivering enough context so that the topic isn't taken and then completely misconstrued. And I think that is the major dichotomy of social media, especially when it comes to baseball. Um, we have been so guilty of it, and it's guilty is likely the wrong word. Um, you know, it's a it's almost a necessary evil at this point, but it's it's very very difficult to provide highly credible information without having enough time to provide context, which which is actually one of the main reasons we wanted to start uh, this podcast series was because like, hey, all right, this can afford us if somebody's really interested and they really want to learn. Um, we can afford the time to really dive into some complex uh, ideologies in baseball training without potentially, you know, just avoiding giving context in, in a nutshell. Yeah. And like everything's on a spectrum and especially like I always struggle with this because um, just like absolutes in baseball training are difficult and I could probably find an outlier case in every situation where I'm seeing someone super successfully doing the exact opposite of what's being told in a clip or an article or, you know, the latest trend. So I can almost get paralyzed by that and be like, there are no truths mm. in this. Like everything works, like nothing works at the same time. So that's, that's been a challenge for me as I kind of like get into coaching is to like, actually develop opinions on things rather than just be like, yeah, I, that works for this guy. That works for this guy. Like it's a challenge. There's so many different ways you can go. And I try to be as agnostic as possible with these things and be really open-minded. But ultimately we are filtering information to the athlete and you need to guide them somewhere because they're so young. Um, they have so much information and so much to learn still that like we have a huge responsibility to help them along the way. So mm. that's been a real challenge for me when I started coaching now. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, you know, the reason it's actually obviously a challenge for you too is, uh, it lends back towards your personality and like, you're not, uh, you know, you're a immensely good human. So you have this sort of struggle between, I don't want to provide them the wrong information. I don't want to steer them down the wrong path. Um, so it, it becomes difficult to align yourself with like, you know, definitive answers in a lot of scenarios. And I think that's, that's actually a sign of a great coach because he's not, um, swayed by something that is shiny and new and yet also not, uh, so close minded and blocked on anything that has work just because it's worked for a majority of athletes. Yeah. I mean, there is no secret ingredient to all of this. It's all, you know, unique individual context is the most important thing. You just said it earlier, like the context of the person, their delivery, their development over time, like all these things have to be taken into account. So to give a simple answer is sometimes an oversimplification for these things. Yeah. But and which is also dangerous. Yeah. So it's, it's always going to be the challenge going forward. So yeah. Symbol could mean ambiguity and ambiguity can be very dangerous because it, it, it leaves a lot of things open for in interpretation. And that tends to be where we get in trouble when we're dealing with, you know, high school age athletes is you're leaving. You're, we're because an athlete might be physically mature. We're assuming the same athlete is emotionally and mentally mature and, uh, and, and intellectually mature. And unfortunately, that sometimes isn't the case. And when we leave a lot of things open for interpretation, we end up allowing an athlete to run down a path that, you know, they wasted three weeks and, you know, potentially created these bad patterns. Yeah. I, I think, um, you know, you've, you've talked about this a lot, like mirroring the athlete, um, allowing them to kind of guide a lot of the conversations. Cause I've, I've done this cause I've, I've been coaching for a few years now, like, uh, they'll ask you a question and you'll have to give an immediate answer without even really thinking. Cause you just want to give them an answer and get them on the way somewhere. But like taking your time, like listening to what they're saying, asking them questions back is usually the more effective <laughs> process mm -hmm. there. Cause they're usually guide you where they want to go with things. And yep. that's usually the best way anyways. Um, so that's, you know, just been part of the process for me learning as a coach too, is go slower, talk less a little bit, allow them to kind of guide the conversation. It's usually more productive. Mm, yeah. The, they'll not only will they provide you with what they, what they're thinking, they'll provide you with their interpretation of what, what they feel they're currently doing. Uh, yeah. I, I think sometimes one of the greatest things that we can honestly say back to a question from an athlete is the same question. 
Um, you know, and I know that sounds weird, but it's like almost just, just re-ask them that they're asking you because they already have an idea what the answer is or, or what they believe the answer is. And that's almost more important than giving them the correct one. Um, cool. Well, all right, let's, let's start back at the top for you. Let's get an understanding. So we're drafted in 2016, right? We're 13th round, 381st pick. Um, what? What is that like? Like you're a junior at high at, at college at this point? Uh, so I went to Quinnipiac, a small school. Um, was really lucky when I came in. It was kind of a culture change that was going on there. Uh, my roommate, Matt Batten, he plays for the Padres now, utility infielder for the Padres. We kind of came in together and we were just kind of young and dumb and didn't know any better and looked around at, you know, some of the guys on the team and realized like we could really be contributors early on the team. Um, so I was lucky to be like the Friday guy when right when I got to college, got beat around early <laughs> in my freshman year um, and then was able to have, you know, kind of stabilize myself, have a pretty good season, um, did well in the conference tournament and then went to summer ball and the NECBL and threw really well there. Um, I think I was the starting pitcher of the year in that league. It was just a huge confidence boost because early in the year we're facing these big schools and I'm getting beat up. I remember we were at the University of Tennessee. Parents flew down there. It's Friday night in Knoxville. And I gave up like nine runs in two innings. They're playing Rocky Top every time a run scores. <laughs> I've heard it every time. And I just, in the back of my mind, just thinking like, maybe I'm not good enough to compete at this level, the mm. SEC, you know, top of the line in college baseball. And then kind of make my way through the season and then get to summer ball and I'm facing a lot of the same guys. There's Vanderbilt, Mississippi State, you know, uh, Tennessee, you're seeing West Coast, UCLA, all these different guys. And I, I threw really well. I, I dominated them for most of the summer. And that kind of just springboarded me into the next season and going forward of like, when I'm right, I can hang with anyone. So it was mm. a huge confidence building you know, experience for me in summer ball. And I know there's a lot of varying opinions on summer ball, but for me, it was, I needed to get out there against the best and, you know, showcase that I could do it to myself really. So. I, I think too, like, you know, with summer ball, I think the, the varying opinions on it uh, again, I guess this is a, a overwhelming theme that we're going to keep coming back to is context is so important, right? For you, it was, you know, I didn't have the year I wanted to have and I needed to learn what it felt like to, you know, overcome this, yeah. be resilient in this um, is what it sounds like. And, um, you know, obviously, like I, I always like to bring awareness and logic to like a lot of things because it tends to strip some of the emotions of their power. But, you know, the the chance that you were facing freshmen uh, swinging against you at Tennessee is slim. Whereas when you're going back to the NECBL, you're now playing against guys that are your age, even though they're at that level. And even though they're SEC guys, you're still now playing people that have the same, at least experience level that you do. They might be still significantly more talented, but the experience now is, is at least leveled out. Yeah. And I was actually probably ahead of most of those guys because mm. of how much exposure I got as a freshman. Um, you know, I had 90 innings as a freshman. That's, wow. that's quite a bit compared yeah. to what you see from most places. And that was a huge part in my decision-making process was I needed to go somewhere where I was going to play. Um, that was a huge decision. You know, that was really a huge part of why I went there. I was getting recruited by some bigger schools and you know, I'd just seen guys go to some of these bigger schools and sit on the bench for a year and then they kind of just faded out. And I knew like I had played three sports in high school. I hadn't spent the majority of my time training for baseball. So I needed reps on the field and I needed to get exposure to a high level of competition where I was from Massachusetts didn't necessarily have that. Um, so I needed to be in the game, learn on the field. And it's kind of counterintuitive to some of what goes on in baseball training today is a lot of it goes back to just, we're going to train it out. But mm. I do think there's a huge, um, learning opportunity from just being in games and competing. Oh, uh, such a great point. And, and I would say again, context, context depended, right? Like, you know, you were in a, you were in a situation where you needed game exposure yeah. because. Um, you were playing at a level and you made that choice, which is an incredible choice. And, you know, we plead with most kids to continuously try and make that choice where you're going to go, not only are you going to be wanted, but you're going to be needed right out the shoot. And that was the decision you 
ended up making, you know, out of high school and so beneficial because in order for you to hang at that level, you just needed to get better at your craft. It wasn't necessarily like, oh man, I got to come home and I got to gain four miles an hour or else I'm never playing again because the entire starting rotation is like six, seven, eight miles an hour ahead of me. And I think sometimes a lot of our high level athletes in high school make that misconception that like, oh, it's just going to be the same level I was at and I can continue doing that. No, you're going to go there and those guys are going to be all better than you. And you need to know that going in. And I don't know if I was mature enough to handle that when I, I, when I was coming I don't think many are. Same thing. It's, uh, you know, I had some looks from professional teams. There was zero chance in the world I was ready to go to professional baseball when I was 18 years old. Like mm. Physically, mentally, emotionally, not mature enough to handle it. And probably similar going to a large school and being you know, in that kind of world where you're competing against top line talent all the time. I don't know if I had the confidence in myself and the experience to handle that. So I think for me personally, and we have a lot of different guys with different makeups, but for me personally, I needed to go somewhere where I was going to be on the field and a contributor pretty early on. Mm. And and I think you you make a great point there that your confidence wasn't ready, right? And I, I think if we can start to understand confidence as a muscle, right? And most people like thinking that it's just this sliding scale that can slide one way so much and then slide up the other way. It's actually really difficult for it to like completely slide and completely slide, right? It's it's more apt to uh, shift slightly in the moment, but then return back to homeostasis. And I think what a great, like, whether you made that consciously or not, you know, coming out of high school, which it sounds like you did. A lot with doing my parents. I think they knew me pretty well. Ah, and good. they were both college athletes. All my siblings play college sports too. So they had some general experience with the situation. I think they uh, guided me quite well in that situation and being somewhere where I was decently close to home. Um, it was like hour and a half, two hours away in a spot where I was going to be comfortable as a smaller division one school. I did really want to play division one baseball. That was a huge goal of mine in high school. So, um, I think they were extremely helpful, mm. um, and kind of guiding me to the right situation. Yeah. Uh, so crucial. And, and, you know, for a lot of our guys, maybe their parents didn't have that same track record, right. That yours did. And, and I think ultimately we try to fulfill that role, not the parent role, but the guidance role in terms of that. And really the only way you can is by being authentic and and honest with the individual as to what they're going to need based on their, you know, mental makeup in terms of how they're going to respond being in these high, high pressure scenarios 24 seven. Yeah. Cause if it was probably up to me, I would have chased the biggest logo and the brand mm -hmm. and some of the big schools that were recruiting me, it would have been very enticing for me. But I think having some people in your life that can have some more experience, have some more life experience talking to a 17 or 18 year old kid <laughs> who doesn't always process things properly or, you know, with full context is incredibly important. So I hope we can do that as coaches as well. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're, we're there, we're, we're at Quinnipiac. We end up getting drafted, like we said, in the 13th round. What was the experience getting drafted in the, in, in that 13th round? Because, you know, we have a lot of guys that are going through that now, you know, like even some out of high school, some in college currently. And I, I think all of theirs is very different. And I, I think it's always super important to ask that, especially when we have somebody on that's, that's been drafted because to get context on that experience is so crucial for many of these guys. Yeah. So going into my junior year, I was kind of probably one of the top pitchers in the Northeast area to kind of watch. Um, so I was being evaluated all the time for the first time, really. Scouts were coming in and looking at me as filling out questionnaires, meeting with them. Um, How much pressure does that add? Mm. That change your dynamic with your teammates? Um, <clears throat> I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm not, I'm not sure. We had a couple other guys who were kind of draft hopefuls as well. Mm -hmm. So I think they enjoyed the exposure um, of that as well. Um, yeah. You know, there's, it's tense, you know, I don't, I think, you know, we all ultimately at that level have some kind of aspirations of playing professionally, whether it's realistic or not for everyone that was there. It's, it's hard to say, but um, yeah, it's, 
getting used to throwing in front of scouts, being evaluated all the time was a learning curve for me. Um, I would have the tendency to like really overbuild the moment. Every time I was in front of a scout, it was the most important time I was throwing. Um, you could like really overthink it and then replay it over in your head afterwards. You know, did I throw that slider in the right spot? You know, my fastball velo was slightly down today and you can take yourself on the roller coaster ride that we we're referencing earlier with your emotions. But over time, I just kind of got accustomed to it. And the most effective thing for me ultimately was just focusing on competing in the game and trying to win the game. If I could simplify it to that. Um, I usually perform pretty well and the rest kind of took care of itself. And that's much simpler to do in college baseball than professional baseball, I'd say, because in college, you're playing with all your best friends. You've spent all this time together. You live together. You're all bought in. You know, we're all on the same level playing field in terms of who got paid what. We're all just in college broke. Yep. And so ultimately, it was much easier to kind of have that buy-in of the team and just focusing on that. And so I think I did pretty well um, handling the attention that I got. And then going into kind of draft day, this is funny, like I, I didn't have an advisor or an agent with me at the time. So kind of relying on just what I was hearing, talking to some of the scouts, my coaches were giving me some information. And the general consensus from what I was hearing was that I was probably going to be five to eight in terms of the round I was selected. So in my mind, that's probably means I'm going to go in the second or third round. Like, because that's, that's <laughs> you go to the best case scenario in that situation, you hear five to eight and you think probably going to go in the third. So um, I'm watching the board the first day and I, I think they only did the first round on the first night. Um, you know, obviously I'm not going to go, but I'm kind of watching with a side eye, like maybe, maybe. And then we go to day two, which is rounds two through 10. We go to day two of the draft. It's rounds, I think, two through 10 now. And I'm fully expecting to get picked. Um, you know, like four or five, six go by, not even a call from a scout or anyone. I'm starting to sweat a little bit. Um, and then we get to like seven, eight, nine, and I'm getting calls um, from a couple of teams and they're not sounding too enthusiastic. They're just kind of asking me my temperature on things. And finally, like in the eighth round, I got a call from the Cubs and really expecting to hear from them soon. Um, and then it, it never happened. And so two through 10 go by and the day's over and I didn't get picked. And I'm absolutely devastated. Just the world is over. It was the worst day of my life, I remember just sitting in my basement, like crying, just by myself. My girlfriend was there with me. We were watching some like Pixar movie and I didn't even hear a word of the movie. I was just sitting down there thinking like, it's over, like not going to get even get picked. There's like 20 more rounds and I'm just convinced it's over now. Um, but that night started to get some calls from scouts that, you know, potentially going early the next day and, you know, get through the night. It was quite dramatic. I would probably like looking back on it now, but it's crushing when you're going through it because sure. it's everything to you. It's your hopes and dreams. It's your life work that's on the line and you're just getting rejected watching pick go pick, pick by pick go by and you're just getting rejected over and over again. Um, but ended up going in the 13th round of the Brewers pretty early on in the day. Um, so that made it a lot better. But yeah, once it happens, you know, all is forgiven. It's the best day ever. Sure. Um, you get go, get looking forward to what's coming next. Um, they told me I was on a flight to Montana like in two days to go out to short season to start pitching. So you kind of snap back into like now I got to compete, got to perform. So it's just such a whirlwind of emotions. It's hard to describe to people when you're kind of put on display like that. And all your family's watching, all your friends are watching because they know generally what's kind of supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's like your first real exposure to that too. Because once you start playing professional baseball, all your friends and family are following all the time. They want yep. you to do really well. And that becomes kind of a burden to carry is, you know, you want to do well for them. They put in so much time and effort for you as well. Um, and you don't always perform well too. So like when you fail, you also feel like you're failing them. So that was probably my first exposure to that where there's the weight of other people looking to me to kind of perform and do well. And, you know, all the time and effort they had put into me and helping me along the way, I wanted to do really well for them. So mm. it was just an interesting experience. And there was plenty of more situations like that along the road. But yeah, the draft is it's so compact too. It's just like it wraps the whole experience up into like one tight yeah. window. It's just crazy. So uh, the, uh, an enormous amount to to go through there. Let's go. 
No, no, no. It, it, it was great too, because you know why you could, you could tell the, uh, how emotionally attached you were to that entire moment because it, it was like this huge roller coaster, and I could almost feel it in your words building back up to the moment you were drafted. And then it was sort of like this lull. And then now all of a sudden there's another downslope coming. And, and it's amazing how we remember even, even how you talked about that, right? You're, you're so underwhelming of the actual successful yeah. moment, yeah. but yet the, the negative, all this negative emotion that was attached to it is what you actually held onto. It's a common theme with my playing <laughs> career. I think you'll see because I remember the negative stuff quite well and vividly. I think that's most people because you're, you, what you're remembering is the emotional pain. And, uh, like we said before, success is so fleeting and it's so the, even the reward of it is so fleeting, right? We don't, we don't realize that and remember it. And it's not being grateful or being aware or anything like that. It's just that the emotion is, it doesn't have that much energy behind it because you've actually expensed all the energy already dreaming about it, right? You, you were, you were there already. And so like so much of that energy is gone. So that's why when you have this successful moment, you're just like, oh, well, yeah, like I knew this was going to happen. This is what I wanted. It's a relief too, because, you know, you, you touch the hot stove and it hurts. Right. You don't want to do that again. So a lot of times, you know, you think about like my mindset going into games was like, man, just don't fail. Like, because it, yeah. it hurts when you fail. It's yeah. not fun. You know, you know, it's not fun to give up eight runs in front of 8,000 people and have your parents be in the stands and you feel like you let them down. You know, right. those feelings you really try and avoid, which is a, a dangerous place to be in as an athlete of trying not to fail. So uh -huh. that was something I struggled with a lot. So, all right, let's go all the way back. I want to go back to the moment where we talked about, um, you know, you're going through this draft process and, 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 and it's like in the prep stages here where now you're being tracked by some pro teams. And the reason I want to do this is, you know, every year, year in and year out, we have probably two to four guys that are like, you know, we'll get phone calls starting in like, you know, early in the off season and likely over the summer. And it's like, hey, this guy like put himself on the map over the summer. You know, what can you tell me about him? You know, what are you thinking? And now we start getting the phone calls from their advisors and, and so on and so forth. You know, what, what's their training program going to look like? You know, I need to prepare to have them in front of this guy and that guy and, and all this hoopla of basically this promotional period of this individual starts to come to light. But I thought the thing that was most interesting about what you had stated was um, your ability to now all of a sudden just remember to win the game is what helped you. And, and in reality, uh, that's really just bringing yourself back to the present moment. Yeah, but you were able to attach a very logical and um, a very realistic outcome goal for yourself so that it kept your focal point there as opposed to being in the future or worrying about the past. And it was, I want to win this game. Yes, there's people here that I need to impress and everything, so on and so forth, but they'll be impressed if I win the game. And if I can keep the focal point on winning the game, you can remove a lot of the emotional baggage from everywhere else. Yeah. And, you know, I think it just simplified it for me in a way where I was able to just, like you said, kind of block out the noise around the rest of the situation. And you feel like when you're kind of in competition, especially in college baseball, that like you're in there with your brothers. So I always felt like I felt supported in that mm. time. If I got into that mindset of just, I'm going to be in there with the guys and we're just going to try and win this series. We're just going to try and win this game or win this inning, you know? Yeah. So it was very a uh, simple approach, but I think it was really effective for me. I think it's really well, it's amazing how impactful your network is Yeah, right? in that right. moment, your support network. Yeah. And that's like, I think why so many professionals look back at college baseball so fondly. Yeah. Is because they don't have that when they right. get to the next as level. As soon as, you know, money starts getting involved and you're going team to team and now competing with these people that you're on the team with, it gets a little more complicated. So mm. It's college baseball is a simpler time in that aspect because, you know, you come in with these guys. The goal is simple. Usually, um, oftentimes when you get to division one baseball, you're just really excited to be there and you want to be a contributing member of the team. You're not thinking about 
what round in the draft you're going in right. and how you stack up on the prospect list or all these different things that get um, kind of in your head as you get older and advance in levels of baseball. So um, yeah, if you talk with most pro guys, minor leaguers, major leaguers, I think a lot of them would say college baseball is probably their most enjoyable experience mm. as an athlete. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is many would, would often even indicate that high school baseball has that same potential, yeah. right? As long as, you know, their, their team is good and their coaching is good and so on and so forth. But so, all right, uh, fast forwarding now into, you know, your actual draft experience, right? Uh, you mentioned the fact you didn't have an advisor and how much do you think that played into sort of, uh, some of your naiveness of how you thought it was going to go and then how it actually went and then whether or not you think that's a positive or negative thing. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think everyone's situation's unique to them. Like my parents are so good to me. They're so involved and, um, just very intelligent, sound decision-making people. They were kind of my advisors at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, both the coaches I had at Quinnipiac played professional baseball. So they had experience with the situation, getting drafted, um, working with scouts. So I had a really solid group of people around me at the time. I don't know if it would have gone different if I had an advisor. It's easy for me to look back and say I would have went in the eighth round, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure how the draft would have shaken out. Realistically, when I look back on it, I was a right-handed pitcher that was 88 to 92 with a, some pretty good off-speed pitches. Like There's a lot of pitchers like me. Um, right. So that's probably where I would have gone. Maybe a couple of rounds earlier. Maybe I go in the ninth round. I don't know. But um, that's probably about right for what I was at the time. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very cool. And, you know, and I think the best best statement you make there is like contextually, it's different for each guy, right? You know, you got a guy that's going to go higher up and reason they're going to go higher up is because they're an outlier, right? They likely need negotiating because they're making a tremendous financial decision. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. If you're looking at top five rounds, I think you absolutely need someone right. with experience in the field and who has kind of navigated those situations before. Um, for me, it was a little bit different, but yeah, I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just saying it's always situation dependent mm -hmm. and you know, each guy's probably uniquely has a different situation in terms of their support system. You now, what round they're likely to go in. And like you said, if you negotiate poorly in one of those high rounds, it is a massive financial decision. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars swings. Um, cool. So, all right, we're going out to Montana, uh, you know, and, and you're going to play, would you say short season? Yeah. And, uh, what, what is your first like impression of major league baseball? Well, it was minor league baseball. Well, but, yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, Professional baseball. Yeah, so I was kind of a sheltered kid um, in terms of Massachusetts. Then I go to a school in Connecticut. Um, I play summer ball in the NECBL in Massachusetts. The next year I go to the Cape Cod League in Massachusetts. So um, spent most of my <laughs> life in the Northeast yeah. in you know the New England area. So jumping on a flight out to- Rural from, Northeast too, not like- Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like not metro. like I'm in- Boston or anything. I'm mm -hmm. out in Western Massachusetts. Um, my town has 3000 people in it. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So then I'm jumping on a plane out to Montana, the airport in Helena, which is the capital has like one lane that looks like basically somebody's driveway. <laughs> and then we're getting in the back of a pickup truck. I have all my equipment with me and they're just driving us to the field. We drop our stuff off and then we get shuttled over to our host family. So we're staying with host families. Um, not what I expected it to be. The field was um, not overwhelming, but way better than what I was probably used to. Mm -hmm. I think I was so excited to be a part of that experience early on that I probably look at it with rose colored glasses now, but it was very stressful for me in terms of, um, it's just a complete shock to the system in terms of what your lifestyle is like now. I was very comfortable where I was. I got to see my friends and family all the time, got to see my girlfriend all the time. And now I'm shot halfway across the country and I'm on my own with a completely different group of people. In the well, I think that's, yeah, I think that's such an important point there because we just talked about the like magnitude and and significance of having this really close knit network and what that means for your confidence, even for your focus and your your capacity to to stay you know in in quest of who you want to be. And now all of a sudden that's completely stripped from you. Whole new environment, whole new group of people. 
uh, so much more independence. And like, you know, I think for some too, even like, uh, you know, you came from a, you know, smaller division one school in the Northeast, right? It's not going to have the look, feel, or atmosphere of a, you know, SEC school that's going to basically be a professional baseball team in terms of how they're taking care of fed access to all this. So, you know, to you, that piece of it, uh, I think still allowed you to have those rose colored glasses. Whereas like, you know, the, the loss of network, I mean, what's that like in the first week? It's so overwhelming. You're just trying to stay afloat, I'd say. Um, yeah, but luckily, like as a small D1 guy, you're just innately probably a little bit more grittier than someone mm-hmm. who's been into a big conference with the resources they have. Um, so Especially I'm, being in the Northeast. Thing. Yeah, and I'm like, mm-hmm. they're putting food out after? Like, this is incredible. <laughs> we get fed? Like, yeah, so that was great for me. I, I, I adjusted very well to that part of it. Like, the grittiness of it was easy for me. It was more of like, now you're tossed in into this new place with all these guys who you're now called professional baseball players and you're just assigning in your brain and they're all, you know, going to be major league all-stars. And Mm. how am I going to out compete this guy? Um, You're watching them throw bullpens and seeing how you stack up against them. We're all two days out of the draft now. So we're all kind of eyeballing each other already, seeing where we measure up in the group, you know, who's, who we think is going to kind of fade out, who we see as like a top dog. So I don't want to call it like a prison situation, but like you're all in this tight little area and you're all kind of trying to figure out the pecking order very quickly. Mm, who's going to emerge the alpha? Yeah. And where where do you fall on that? Yeah. it's. It, I mean, that's hard, right? Because you have then you're deciding, okay, where do I fit in? How do I fit in? And how do I climb uh, if I'm not the top dog in this moment in time? Because ultimately... Yes, they're your teammate, but that's a super loose word at that level. That is somebody that you need to be better than in order to get to where you want to be. Especially when you first start. I mean, over time, you develop relationships with all these guys Mm -hmm. and you start to learn the landscape a little better and how to navigate it emotionally. But when you're first drafted and you're tossed into that situation, you know, you think everyone's watching you all the time and your first move is basically going to decide whether you're going to make it to the major leagues or not. Mm. And so the stress level and the awareness level are at peaks all the time. You don't know any of these people typically. Maybe you played summer ball with one guy and you're kind of latching on to him. And, you know, I think we practiced for two days, two or three days, and then we were right into games. So that usually kind of starts to settle things down. Once you get into games, you start to get into the rhythm of the baseball season again. Um, You kind of just go back to your old habits. But yeah, that first week and a half where you're just out there, it is just, like I said, a shock to the system. Yeah. I was going to ask, what, at what point do you start to level? Like where you're just like, okay, I'm, I'm a professional baseball player. I know what I need to do. This is how I need to act and let me go about my business. Yeah, I think I was always probably poor at this, but I would like set goals for myself. And when I got into pro ball, it was just to make it through one professional season without being released. And if I said in my mind at the time, if I did that, I would be content with it and I would feel good about it. And then immediately I moved the goalposts on myself as soon as I accomplished that goal. Mm-hmm. So, um, which is not a terrible thing. It's, yeah. you know, probably the original goal was too safe. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I just thought if I could make it through the season, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd feel satisfied with that. And then as you start to play and look at the talent, you're like, okay, I can hang with these people. Um, I always tried to lean into my strengths, which was just, I was just a gritty competitive pitcher. Um, I dealt well with adversity, like second and third one out, like I would find a way to limit damage. I wasn't a pitcher that was ever going to like usually beat himself. And so I kind of found a role as like a consistent performer, um, originally kind of coming out of the bullpen and it was kind of multiple innings, did pretty well in that situation and then kind of was given a start. Um, but I was really only in short season for like three weeks before I got promoted to low A in Wisconsin. So it was a very short, impactful time in Montana. It's probably the single most like 
impactful month of my life when I like think about how much I processed and dealt with mm. and how much it shaped me into the player I ended up kind of becoming. But yeah, that first month is treacherous and can kind of make or break a lot of guys. Did you see guys that it broke where they fell off and they were never going to be recovering? Immediately. I mean, you see guys who start who were even drafted higher than me come in and could struggle to play catch as someone who was at, you know, a Pac-10 school closing games, all of a sudden money became an important factor in it and they were assigned a number and their signing bonus was how much, you know, they were inherently worth. And the weight of that became something that was overwhelming. And I sympathize with that as someone who's, you know, struggled as I got to the higher levels of baseball to deal with the money aspect. Um, yeah. So it happened immediately. And you see that, especially in short season, you'll see it in the rookie leagues as well. Um, there is kind of a high failure rate with guys. Wow. So the, the inability to stay present and, and grind away day in and day out. So how, how did you, obvi- uh, okay, not obviously, but you, you signed for 60,000, you said? 100,000. Okay. So you signed for 100K, which is substantial money. It's not like it's no money. I'm sure there was guys that were there that signed for significantly more. Um, but 20 years old, that's like an right. incredible amount of money to yep. a 20 year old. So yeah, I was feeling good about my financial situation at the time. <laughs> so how do you, how do you stay present then? How are you able to not allow the future earnings to impact the current? I don't know if I did that well, to be honest. Okay. Um, I think that was always something um, in a lot of ways that I would worry about. Um, I knew I had this signing bonus and I knew what minor league players were making over the course of five seasons. And in my mind, I'm already starting to plan out how can I ration this out to cover the time? Because I was worried how I was going to pay for things, um, Mm. what my financial situation was going to be like if I didn't make it. So in a lot of ways, I kind of wish I wasn't like that. I wish I was more all in, but I felt myself kind of hedging at times. You know, I get jobs in the off season. I finished school in my first off season instead of going to instructs. So I was always thinking about the next thing, which has set me up very well for my post playing career. But there's some of part of me that wishes I had just been fully all in and not worried about some of those things when Mm -hmm. I was 22 years old. Um, I think young people have a pretty poor track record with projecting what their next five years, what their 10 years looks like. Old people Um, do too. Yeah. So to make a lot of those (laughs) life decisions and how I process things on things that were 10 years away and probably never happened in my life right. was probably a mistake at the time. Hmm. Did you feel like it didn't allow you to be as obsessed as you wanted to be? I was always obsessed. I, I, I worked as hard as I could possibly work, but I, in my mind, I was never really sure if I was good enough. So I always wanted to have a backup plan. And if there's one common theme I saw about the guys who made it, they were sure they were good enough always. Mm. Um, and we talked about confidence earlier. Yeah, I think it is the number one single thing you need to succeed in, in professional baseball is a stubborn confidence in yourself that is unbreakable from outside influence. Yeah, it's almost a blind confidence. Yeah. It's a uh, it's called solipsism. Uh, it means that the reality that I've created is the only one that is plausible, um, and I don't I can't fathom other realities, um, which is something that. Yes, most professional athletes and, and heck, most highly successful individuals, regardless of what they're doing, must have um, because you're going to face unrelenting uh, failure in your life if you're trying to accomplish anything great. Um, okay, so coming out of that first year, right? I know you just said like, hey, I got jobs. I was finishing school. I was doing all these things. When you're coming out of your first year, well, even in your first year, how much communication are you having with the organization other than like perhaps even like your coaches at that level? Yeah, I think I was at a really unique time in baseball. It was like 2016, 2017. It's really when all the analytics really started to take hold within the organizations. But at the time when I was first starting, it was kind of a lot of the old guard was still there. Um, You know, former pitchers, you know, former coaches who were taking on a lesser role. So it was a lot of old school mentalities with that stuff. I remember when I first got to the Brewers, they had a no two seams for first year guy rule. 
you weren't allowed to throw two seams or sinkers as a first year player because it was seen to be as a pitch that couldn't be commanded as well. And they wanted to teach four seam command. Luckily, wow. somehow I was the loophole and they let me throw them because I threw strikes, um, which was huge for me because if I had to throw four scenes, <laughs> I would have been out of baseball by my first year. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of that old school rules and mentality that, you know, there was these universal rules among the organization. They had strict rules about stuff. And then it just started to change. You started to see, you know, the rap sodos and the track man starting to work their way into the teams. We'd have um, professional or player development people come in with not necessarily a huge baseball background. Um, and so that was a learning curve for me as well. We didn't have a ton of access to that stuff when I was in college. And so it took me a while to get up to speed with that, but it was a unique time because it was all changing very fast. And that's not to say that the old guard was all wrong. I think they have a lot of valuable insights and there's a lot of uh, useful things that you can take from someone with a lot of playing experience. Mm -hmm. And then it was just kind of the new data wave coming in and kind of taking hold of baseball at the time. So uh, with with the emergence of all this data, with the emergence of all this information, how was what you needed to get better at communicated with you? It, it was never communicated very well. <laughs> okay. um, I, there were times where I would throw, I remember we used to throw on rap sodas and, and the bullpens, and this was probably 2018, 2019. So it was my second or third year. And we weren't even like allowed to look at it because they were just not very great at processing the information. A lot of the pitching coaches still weren't totally up to speed with that stuff. Um, they probably didn't want you to not understand it better than them. Yeah, exactly. And there was a there was a guarded way in which they gave you information. Um, so you're always being evaluated, not necessarily being told all the information. I had a few really good pitching coaches who are doing really well in that organization now who did a great job of communicating mm -hmm. um, when they came in. Chris, Chris Hook, who is the, the pitching coach for the big league team now, was one of our rovers, one of our pitching coaches who would rove around. And he had a, such a clear way of communicating what you were doing well and what you needed to improve when he would come in. And it was just a breath of fresh air every time when he would come in because it was so concise and clear in what he was telling you. And you could tell he had took some time to actually dive into it. Um, but that was rare early on. Um, and then by the time I was done playing, it was basically all metrics based. Mm -hmm. So there was not a ton that was based on really um, like ERA, innings pitch wins, all that stuff was out the doors. A lot of it was swing and miss, um, your ability to kind of have outcomes that weren't based on luck. So pop-ups, fly balls, those types of things were all valued very highly. Yeah. The result orientation of what you were able to do. So yeah. potential and then result. So I kind of caught the bad end of that. Like early on, I was um, a very consistent pitcher who kind of moved through the organization well because I, I threw a lot of innings. I could be consistent in five or six innings every time I was a ground ball pitcher. I managed games well. I managed the lineup well. Um, and so I could be relied upon. I don't really ever think I was totally thought of as a, a high prospect or anything, but I was in the mix as someone who, you know, if they needed a guy in a situation, I think I was being considered. And then that kind of new wave um, kind of came in, like you said, the outcomes based thing. And it just was not inducive to the way I pitched, um, conducive to the way I pitched. So I don't think I necessarily scored well on a lot of those things. So probably a lot of risk centered around believing you could continuously be successful. Yeah. Especially, you know, what you learn as you play professional baseball is, you know, these, all these people have bosses too. So when you, when they're giving a recommendation on a guy, they feel like should be promoted or moved up to the big leagues is they have to live up to that decision as well. And usually the easiest decision is one that can be explained and velocity can always be explained. Yep. Swing and miss can always be explained. Um, there's always a reason behind that. Whereas someone like me who didn't necessarily have great metrics would be a hard one to explain if it didn't work out. Yeah. And I mean, it's a conversation you and I were having the other day. The only equator to like the equalizer, right? To velocity is deception, but there's no way to quantify that right now. Yeah. You can do it with movement and location. Yeah. They're trying to, but ultimately the hitter is the most important yep. outcome. Um, there's a lot of you know, we could, there's a, there's an enormous amount of variability, how they're going to perceive that deception anyway. So yeah, no, I, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, it's, it is an important thing for individuals to understand. It is why velocity is king. It's, it makes life 
it raises your ceiling and increases your potential of being successful, period. And when you are struggling to gain that velocity or when you don't have that velocity, uh, everything, your margin for error just shrinks like crazy. Um, to be honest, I think they're probably right. Like, <laughs> like there were probably guys who were better pitchers than me at the time. And I, by the end of my career, I was throwing hard. I really worked hard. Well, maybe not, maybe not better pitchers, but they had, they had a higher potential. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I understand why it happened. I'm not like bitter or upset that mm. it didn't happen. A lot of it is timing and situation of those things. Um, I have no like qualms with how I tried to develop myself throughout my career. By the end, I was throwing harder than I'd ever thrown. I felt like I was the best version of myself in terms of stuff. Um, so it was a process for me. I think young pitchers, um, I see this a lot. They get very frustrated early and I wish I could like tell them how many iterations of myself I had to create throughout the years <laughs> to make it through each level and how many times it went sideways. Um, like it's constantly evolving. You're constantly seeing guys trying to improve themselves. They'll go down rabbit holes, take themselves sideways, backtrack, and then start again. That's just the process, especially when you're at the top level, you are looking for that final 0.001% to separate yourself from the other people. And it's a, it's a long, arduous process. It's not a one day thing that clicks usually. So, mm -hmm. and usually sometimes you don't even know when you've made the progress because it's taking so long. Um, right. It's not as easy as just two miles an hour magically yeah. here. Yeah. There's no secret ingredient on these things. Um, it's not alchemy where you can just concoct a way to throw 95 miles an hour. Like it takes time, effort to kind of mine Consistency. this. Yeah. A hundred percent. The... All right, let's talk about your off-season training, right? Because you, you, you're you indicating that there are so many different iterations. How often did the off-season training iterate? Like how, how many different uh, versions of how you were going to attack what you needed to work on? What did that look like? Yeah, I, I think it was always the throwing and the pitch development that I focused on. I did a very, I was very diligent about the weight room and maintaining um, my body. Um, so... That was always just, you know, maintenance and continuing the routine. Um, from the throwing side, I was always trying to learn a slider. I was always trying to increase my velocity. So I've done plenty of the velocity programs, some successful, some not. Um, the the time I gained the most velocity, and this gets back to the, the other side of the coin I was talking about playing baseball in, the, in games. The time I gained the most velocity was during COVID where I strictly dedicated myself to training for the 12 months that we were doing it um which is which is crazy right because so, that's that's a very like uh it's an antithesis to what we just indicated before right which was but but it's context specific your your new necessity the new goal the new the new training need was velo it wasn't game experience i had 500 professional innings probably close to 800 since college during that time i did not need more game management experience <laughs> at that point the the goal was to gain velocity and i think what's interesting is that can change throughout your career right there can be times where like hey i have enough game experience at this level right now i'm just not good enough to play at this level and it's not from a game management perspective or pitch perspective pitching perspective it's from a or emotional, you know, yeah. maybe you're in a very stable place. Maybe you take care of your body. Like sometimes there, it's just your stuff isn't quite good enough to compete at that level. Mm. And when that is the case, like taking a few months to really dedicate yourself to try and improve a very narrow and specific goal is probably the worthwhile and correct thing to do. So talk about what that looked like. Cause, cause I always do find it interesting. Like obviously, yes, there's more innings in a, minor league baseball season for a pitcher than let's say at a, at a college level, but it's not crazy amounts more. And what I always find interesting is that like, it's a, it's an automatic for guys at the college level to go play summer baseball. Whereas like for guys in minor league baseball, it's like, well, I'm not necessarily going to automatically go and play in a winter league or, or some instructional because I need to work on certain things. And I, I just don't think that that option is often taken by college guys yeah. enough. Yeah. I, well, I didn't even, we didn't even talk about this earlier, but the, the summer after I went to the NECBL, um, 
I took three months and just dedicated myself to that, similar to what I did during the COVID time where Mm. I was just working on building strength and trying to improve my velocity. And that is probably the main reason why I actually got drafted was because my velocity ticked up from my sophomore to my junior year. From what to what? It was probably 86 to 90, and then I was probably 88 to 92, flashing 93s Mm -hmm. by the time I was a junior. Yeah, which is a huge difference maker for guys. I mean, thinking about the capacity to flash a 93 and then, you know, raising your floor, your average, right, all the way up into that, you know, low 90s or or right at that 90 cusp is a vastly different pitcher than somebody who's average fastballs in 86.8. Right. So that just gets back to what we've been saying this whole time is it's all context driven on mm-hmm. these things. Like you need people to help you make the decision, but like the player ultimately kind of usually knows whether they need some more game experience or they need to focus on building the, ar- the arsenal in terms of velocity, pitch design, those types of things. So um, each player is a little bit different, but yeah, there's no one true path for everyone. Sure. Talk about the velocity development um, plans that you followed, like, you know, running guns, pull downs, uh, how often, like just, you know, how varied was that? Yeah. So it started during the COVID year, it started as long toss with my brother at the park, like every day. And we were just, it was not well thought out. Um, it was just, I'm going to rep this out until it happens. Mm. And thank God he was there. He would catch my bullpens after I'd long toss with him every day. And it just wasn't really improving. I was stuck at the same spots I was always stuck at. So um started working with plyo balls right now and really started to be like diligent with how I was setting up my weeks. I'd set up two high intent days during the week and then just try and give myself time to recover. And that worked for me. I probably did the program too long because at the time I was trying to stay ready for if I got called to Mm. uh, an alt site camp or a taxi squad. So I ended up doing it the whole season and then just continued to do it in my off season and probably burned myself out in that capacity. So I got good at structuring my weeks. I did not get good at structuring my months. Yeah. So you you weren't able to take a global view, a more more macro view and and understand how this should undulate, which which plays into why we we're so strong on deloading guys and and finding opportunities for you know what's called that that overcompensation rebound coming off of recovery. Um, so uh, all right, and then how like in your off seasons we talked about the fact that you know uh, you would find jobs and you would coach and so on and so forth. How did coaching others start to impact how you would train? Yeah, it's when you coach, you realize how little you actually know when. You're not just worrying about yourself. You have to try and apply some of these things that you thought you believed in to other people Mm. and how quickly holes can get poked in that. Um, You know, I I would just talk so much when I was teaching early on. Like I would just, every lesson we'd have, I'd do individual lessons and I would just spend the whole time explaining stuff that I didn't really have a good understanding of. And over time, I just started to kind of take a step back, really observe and take my time with the observation and try not to like jump to conclusions earlier. And then, you know, like we've talked about kind of mirror the athlete, really let them guide the discussion. And then when there was space and, you know, emotional bandwidth for them, for me to jump in and add my opinion, that's when it was really the most effective other than me just machine gunning words and phrases throughout the whole time, like really be thoughtful when I said something to an athlete. Unfortunately, I was terrible at coaching myself. Like I just was really (laughs) bad at it. Um, It was really hard on myself, I think, in a lot of ways, really probably overly critical in a lot of ways. Um, So I don't think it really ever clicked for me as as an athlete, I'd say. So uh, what's interesting about that, right? So it's said that the the mind is immensely, um, especially the creative processing for the mind is immensely dulled and blunted by negativity and pessimism and these emotions that are attached to that. Yet when we're in this positive mindset and we view everything from this like prosperity perspective, our creativity explodes and we're able to see things vastly into the future and create really dynamic ways of accomplishing those things, which I think is what you experience when you coach, right? When we coach and we see an athlete and we can feel the emotional positivity from the athlete and the athlete wants so badly to accomplish something and we want so badly 
for that athlete to do that, we become incredibly creative as to how we can construct the way and the story of them accomplishing what they need to accomplish. Whereas when we look at ourselves, it's like, well, I've done 50,000 of those different things and that ain't going to work. And, and you almost become too close to the whiteboard. You're too closed. You're too, you're too hardened on things that haven't been successful and the closeness that this new path might be to that is almost too close. It's not, it's not grandiose enough. And I would say from the minor league perspective, when we get minor leaguers that are coming in, the big difference between them and guys with uh, even, even like new minor leaguers in comparison to like established guys is um, their willingness to like change everything because they're so incapable of actually like logically thinking about all the steps that took them to get to where they are that they're like, I don't know anything, so I'll change everything. Yeah, it's been an incredible learning curve because I did not coach minor leaguers before I I took the position here. And I figured they were going to be like me and incredibly difficult to work with in terms of coaching and very protective of like what I was as a player and a pitcher, almost guarded in a way and not always open to criticism. That's kind of been the exact opposite, especially with the young guys. They are so open-minded and willing to change that it scares me all the time <laughs> um, to take them down a wrong, yep. wrong path somewhere. Um, but it's really great. And I think, you know, the them being around each other when they train too, I usually kind of train by myself, not with other pitchers. Um, them being around each other is so conducive to just an open growth environment. And it's fantastic. They talk with each other. They talk about the things they're working on. We kind of just get to float out there with them a lot of the time and kind of pick our spots when we, when we give feedback on things. But that's a lot of the best way to learn is just to be with your peers and watch them do something, pick their mind on something. As how I did most of my learning when I was a minor leaguer is out in the outfield, talk with a guy mm-hmm. about how he held the pitch, what he was thinking in this count. You know, how does he handle left-handed hitters with guys in scoring position? Like that's where you really learn. Um, so I think the environment we have is really special in that aspect where they all come in and work together and get to grow together while they're also competing too. You can tell they want to yep. be the, the best. best guy there. They want to be the alpha. But um, there's, they're also protective of the group too. You know, they look out for each other. They all want each other to do well. So it's, it's pretty special. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I would view our most important job as a coach is to, is to cultivate the environment that fosters peer driven learning, um, which is literally what you just outlined. It's, and the reason is, is a, a peer's, uh, feedback carries 10 times the weight that a coach's feedback can provide. And the reason is, is because their language is so different, right? The manner in which they communicate is different. They're, they're in it. The, the automated respect given to that athlete in that moment is so much greater because they're experiencing the same things that athlete is experiencing. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess looking back on your career, right? How or what would you utilize from the ways in which you train to advise sort of new and incoming people, assuming they're not in our facility. Yeah, I would say don't be so guarded and protective of who you are as a player in your identity that you're unwilling to expose yourself to some kind of challenges. I think that group setting that you're talking about is the most important thing we have for those pro guys developing is that they get to work with each other. Um, You know, even if they're exposing a new pitch that they get to work on in a bullpen that they're not confident in, you know, they all have the experience of trying to do that at some point. So there's some empathy there when they're watching a guy work on a new grip or something that he's not quite comfortable with. And they know how to give the feedback in a way that's conducive to growth. So I think if I would have changed one thing about how I trained, I would have put myself into those group settings rather than kind of go out on my own and just try and grind it out and outwork someone and not really ever get the feedback of what it's like to be on a team, be in a group and try and grow together. Mm. Yeah. It's, uh, there's something to be said about working in darkness. Yeah, for sure. There, there is an immense benefit that comes out of that, but having the capacity to create your own darkness in moments of a group is I think the truly most skilled individual having the capacity to 
to take those moments where I can grind, I can still push, I can still compete, I can still compete with myself, or I can manifest an invisible man that I'm competing against, but yet I can still gain the the immense benefits of having this unit around me that is all striving to do the same thing. Yeah. And I was just insecure in my own abilities. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would kind of stray away from that. Um, I didn't want to be in a group training, um, in some kind of group training where I was throwing the slowest, like Mm -hmm. that would kill me inside. That would make me feel like I was going nowhere. So I was always careful to not do that, but ultimately kind of hamstrung my ability to to develop in the off season. I'd kind of always come back around the same velocity um, until, you know, that COVID year where, you know, just through the amount of time I had to do it, it ended up working out. But um, yeah, if you're trying to really grow in the short off season window that you have as a minor league baseball player, which is usually four to five months, you need someone pushing you. You need someone trying to you know, take it up a notch because, you know, when you get to spring training in the season, there's not a ton of time for development. So you have to be really efficient with your time. Yeah. I would argue that, um, I I can't not even argue that. I don't know why I said that, but I would state that what I've seen out of what you were just implying there, we've seen it with young high school kids that'll come in. Right. And where we get told ahead of time, you know, it's a high profile kid or whatever. And we get told ahead of time by some guys that they're like, Oh, get ready for when this kid comes in. Cause like, or even a college kid, like the attitude on this one, the ego is just so great and like, blah, blah, blah. And it's easy for us to sit back and like, oh yeah, that's just because a coach doesn't know how to handle that ego. Um, maybe, maybe that is the case that a coach doesn't know how to handle that ego or that they're the other people they played for didn't. But I think also too, it's, it's the culture and it's the environment. It's the idea that when they walk in, they may have been the greatest somewhere else there's a damn good chance that when they walk in here, they're not going to be the hardest thrower. They're not going to be the best pitcher. And they're certainly not going to be at the highest level more than some of these other guys. And I think what's so interesting is when you watch that athlete, if they can get past that first little bit where they're so guarded and they can let go and they can start to sort of absolve into the environment, their skill level just exponentially rises. And it's incredible to watch. Yeah. And that's the challenge for us too, is we've talked about confidence a lot too, but also the necessity to be in those competitive growth environments. That's like the delicate line we have to try and balance with a lot of guys is exposing them to high level guys that they now have to compete with while maintaining their confidence. And Mm -hmm. you kind of just alluded to it is the guys who respond to that, their confidence actually goes through the roof when they get in those yep. group settings. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm totally on board with that. And even even when they may not be the top dog at that moment, you know, they have to fight their way to get to that next spot. Even if, but if they feel like they're making progress yep. on someone too, that's just as successful as being the top dog in a mm-hmm. lot of ways. Is yeah. they feel like they're gaining ground on someone. So yeah, it's uh, something we need to continuously try and harvest in our facility. Is that that feeling? So yeah, and 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 vice versa too for the guys that are generally the alphas, especially if the alpha is well pronounced, you know, the year prior or coming into that off season. I think it's incredibly dynamic to watch that person have to try and stay there and, and retain that title and, and, you know, uh, be the top dog. And especially if like, you know, their training line doesn't line up or, you know, they're at a different stage, they have to try and find ways to do that. And maybe some other paradigms that, you know, they're not the top dog, you know, be in the weight room and they might be the top dog out on the field, but in the weight room, you know, they're just an average guy. Now, all of a sudden, it gives them an opportunity to maybe paint in a different room and find out what they got in a different room. And, you know, re-hurdling that, re-becoming the alpha in another room, the amount that that can bolster your confidence in other venues and other areas and other arenas of your life is mind-blowing because you have now taken this identity that you have in this one arena, which is playing baseball and training for baseball and competing for baseball, you might be the alpha out on that throwing floor. And if you need to develop that in the weight room and you end up doing it and you end up rising there, your overall self-identity, that confidence just grew. It multiplied like tenfold because now you feel untouchable and you have become this person that 
I have proven once again that I can do this in another arena, they feel like there isn't anything that they can't accomplish. Yeah, that's just standard practice now. That's what you do. You yeah. go into the room and you become the best. So yeah, I think that's pretty unique. Yeah. Awesome. Well, what um, if anything would you leave as closing information for a young aspiring high school athlete, college athlete, um, in terms of the number one thing they need to be doing from a training perspective? The number one thing? Yeah. Just it's just Number one thing in terms of like what you feel, and you may have already hit on it, but what you feel is going to be the most impactful thing for them to do from a training perspective. Just consistency, um, like staying in the process all the time. Like we've talked about it a bunch of times already. Like there is no quick fix on these things. There's no secret ingredient. The consistency day in and day out and what your habits are and what you do ultimately is the single biggest thing that's going to separate you from other people. It's really hard to do stuff six days a week. It's even harder to do it seven days a week. So mm -hmm. um, the consistency at which you stay in your training is to me the most important thing. Cool. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Yeah.